Good morning, everyone. Uh, today's uh, September the 6th, uh, starting a new series of studies and our new book. Hopefully, all of you have got your book. If you don't, uh, please let me know, and I'll make sure you get one. I'll try, I've tried to get them out to everybody. I may have forgotten uh, one or two of you, but uh, my apologies if I did. But anyway, we're starting a new series, and we're studying the, uh, the uh, Ten Commandments, starting off with it. our title is After God's Own Heart, A Fresh Look at the Ten Commandments. And where will we begin? But naturally with uh, placing God first. And then our next five is about honoring God, honoring God, um, honoring parents, honoring life, honoring marriage, and then honoring uh, all uh, my all the relationships, all relationships. So we'll begin this morning with uh, placing God first. That's the title of our first lesson, and that is the appropriate place to begin. You know, the title again says, Place God First. Would you be surprised if I said everyone does that? Yes, they do, don't they? Everyone places a God first. They not, may not place the true God first, but everyone goes after something in their life and puts it first in their life. So they may be the little God, starting with little G, but, uh, but everyone puts something first in their life. It may be money. It may be power. It may be prestige. It may be things. It may be other people. Uh, whatever the case is, if we don't put God first, then we're making God out of other things. We're, we're making other things God. You know, the Bible said it calls this adultery. When we put other things, other people, other beings ahead of God and place them in, in, in front of God and we devote ourselves to them instead of devoting ourselves to God. That's called adultery and that's placing uh, uh God, the second, third, fourth, or even not even nowhere in the top ten, you know. But we need to make sure, according to God, as He says, and we'll see. He said to Himself, "We're to put God first above all things." When we do that, generally speaking, everything else falls into place. Everything else will be okay. Yes, we may still have problems, but we know by putting God first that He's in control and He'll help us and guide us through those situations. Let's go ahead and begin. We're going to be in Exodus and Psalms, and we're going to start off in Exodus, and then we'll jump over to Psalms uh, 16. We'll start off in Exodus 20, 1 through 6. Let me read that for us. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have other gods besides me. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow and Serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's iniquity to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. It's right there in verse 1, it says, Then God spoke all these words. So it's not Moses telling us, it's God speaking through Moses, is telling us where to place God, him, first. He says, I, he goes on to say, I, the Lord, you know, that word was Yahweh, or, or that's the way we think it's pronounced, Yahweh. It was so holy that the Israelites would not even pronounce it. They would write it down, but they would not even pronounce it. So we, we think it's pronounced Yahweh. But he says, I am Yahweh to be. I am the one to be, too holy to pronounce. Your God, uh, talking about, it says, I'm the Yahweh, your God, one who created everything. So I am Yahweh, your creator, is what he's basically saying here. I'm the one who created you. I'm the one who, who uh, am holy and over all things and creator of all things, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. He's not, these people that uh, God was talking to here through Moses had experienced the deliverance from Egypt, had experienced God's bringing them out of slavery and bondage. And that was, it was, you know, slavery is bad in any shape and form. But in that day and time, they was totally under the thumb of the Pharaoh, had to do his bidding, had to do his, and they could legally be killed and no one would be punished for it because they were products or, or, or property and, and didn't have any rights. And yes, we've had slavery in our country and it was wrong then. It's wrong at any time, but it's been throughout history. And uh, so God says, I'm the one that brought you out of that slavery. I'm the one that brought you out of that place of, of slavery. And, you know, you're thinking about that. 
uh, about in, bond, in bondage and slavery, we've all been there. Yeah, we may not belong to another being, another person. Uh, we may have not been bought so by another person, but but sin has has enslaved us. We have all been enslaved by sin in our lives that have uh, separated us from God, and we're enslaved to the sin and to uh, Satan's whims. And God has brought, given us an opportunity to be brought out of slavery also through the blood of Jesus Christ. So, so we have that benefit as well. So that's another reason to put God first, even us today. You know, he was talking about the uh, uh, the people brought out of Egypt for that day, but in a sense, when we accept Christ, we brought out of uh, bondage in Egypt, you might say, and we're uh, made whole and we're made free to follow God and love God. Uh, he says, do not have other gods besides me. And you notice that's a little G, not a big G, because God says there is no other gods. When we make gods, they're not true gods. So they're just things that we place in front of God and they become our gods and we make them our gods. So uh, God said, don't put other gods or don't have other gods besides me. Do not make idols for yourselves, whether in the shape of anything. In other words, we're not to make idols of anything. You know, you, some, some uh, religions have Buddha, a little fat belly fellow that sits in the corner or on the table. Some guy, uh, others have other representations of their gods that they worship and they put on a pedestal and they bow before it. We're not to do that, not even with the cross. We're not to make the cross our idol. You know, we most of us have crosses in our homes, may wear them around our necklace, but we don't worship those crosses. We see that cross as a symbol of what God went through, what Jesus went through, that we may have salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, not the cross. So we're not even to make that cross or or statue of uh, Mary or, or St. Joseph or St. Andrews or any of those things are not to be worshipped. They're not our gods. They're just uh, the reminder of who God is. And so we've got, we have got to be careful that we don't start placing our trust in these in the cross itself, you know, that object that we hang on the wall or put around our neck or any other Thing that we formed with our hands or, or, or see in the sky like the moon, the stars, you know, they're not to be worshipped. We're to worship true and only God. That's why, uh, God, that's what God's calling us to, to worship him and him only. He says, do not bow and worship to them and do not serve them. Why? He goes on to say, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And, you know, sometimes we think of the word jealous or jealousy as a negative. But in this case, God is saying, I will not accept anything less but your uh, worship of me and me alone. In other words, he's not going to share the, his love, uh, uh, our love for him with anyone else. It's him or nothing. We're to serve God. We're to worship God. We're to praise God and not focus on other things and put them before God. You know, what we was talking about a while ago, money, power, prestige, that's fine in our lives when we don't let it become our gods. When we don't allow it to separate us from God. When we don't allow it to come before God and, and come in between us and, and divert our attention from God to those things. We need to focus upon God and God alone and put him first in our life and all these other things. If they're there, fine. If they're not, fine. Because all we need is God in our life. And that's what God's saying. He alone will be our salvation. He alone is our only way of salvation. So he's a jealous God. He don't want to uh, share us with these other things that really going to wind up destroying us. And it's good for us. He says, uh, I'm a jealous God punishing the children for the father's iniquity to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. What we do with God has a lasting effect upon us. It has a lasting effect not only upon us, but upon those that we have a influence upon. Our children, our grandchildren, our parents even, uh, our friends. How we respond to God is going to affect those around us. When we reject God, deny God, and curse God, and, and uh, 
act and live as if there is no God, we're teaching our children, we're teaching our people around us to do the same. And, you know, when we, we see generations upon generations of people making the same mistakes over and over again, uh, the, the child sees a, the dad saying, don't drink, son, but he's drinking. And then the child goes up many times to do the same thing. And sometimes it even gets worse. But we need to live by example. We need to follow God and show others how to follow God and show others to live for God. And when we do that, we're showing them a positive path. We're giving them a, a positive way of living and helping them to see that God will bless those who are following him. And God punishes those who don't. And it's, it's it, you know, it's something that's going to, uh, there's always exceptions to the rule because we're, we're sinful people and, you know, we may, they may be good parents, good uh, Christian parents who has a child that doesn't follow God. And that's going to happen from time to time. But generally speaking, when we're serving God and we're faithful to God, God's going to bless our lives and he's going to bless our children and their children. And, uh, and, and raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's where we need to begin. That's what we need to serve. Uh, one of the good reasons, the best reasons to serve God is that we are following in his footsteps. We're following him and we're helping others to follow him also. Then in Psalm, we're going to skip over to David, a uh, man after God's own heart. Uh, and we're going to see, see this in Psalms 16, 1 through 4. Is where we start here with, with what uh, David wrote in Psalms. He says, Protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have nothing good besides you. As for the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones. All my delight is in them. The sorrows of those who take another God for themselves will multiply. David was a man after God's own heart. David was a young man. We all know the story about David and Goliath, how he was faithful, how he uh uh, stood for God, how he uh, was not fearful of this giant. He was he went uh, in front of him with a slingshot and some rocks, and he did it in the name of God, and he was successful. God blessed him. And David went after God. He searched for God. David made his mistakes. David uh, did some things that was wrong and, and, and not right at all. Uh, adultery uh, uh, set uh, a man up to be murdered. Uh, he was not a good, uh, a good at times, but he did seek God, and he did place God first. He made his mistakes, but he, he sought after God, and he had his trials and his troubles, and he went to God when he got in these uh, situations. He says, protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. David went to God when he faced difficulties. Yes, as I said, he had his problems. But when he faced difficulty, when he recognized what he had done was wrong, he went back to God. And he always went to God. And when things got difficult in his life, when Solomon, uh, not, uh, not Solomon, uh, but, but when Saul was chasing him and, and, and seeking his life, he sought God. Uh, when he would run out of Jerusalem by uh, his son uh, uh, Absalom, he sought God. When, when, he had to, when he was confronted with his... Uh, adulterous situation he repented and sought God he always went to God when things was difficult and he, he searched for him he sought his protection and this is no case and we don't know exactly what situation this might have been but he was probably having a tough time you know we all have tough times in our lives uh, we we face difficult situations whether it's loss of job loss of family member loss of uh, income loss of a uh, uh, friendship, uh, a loss of a spouse. Uh, we all have those difficult times and we need to seek God as David did in those times and take refuge in God. You know, when you say you take refuge, uh, I think of uh, people, refugees who leave a country where they're being uh, murdered and, and being, uh, 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 you know, uh, put uh, put out and, and, and hurt and, and, uh, things of this nature, they leave those countries seeking refuge in other countries, hoping other countries will protect them from those who are seeking their harm. And that's the way we are. We, we go, re we seek our refuge in God, get away from the wiles of the world, the, the troubles of the world, and seek 
the refuge in the arms of God. And that's what David was doing here. He said, I take refuge in you. He knew he could go to God and feel the comfort of God and love of God and know that there may be other people that hated him and, and disliked him and were seeking his death and his harm, but he knew God loved him. And he felt love when he was in God's arms and he felt that God's protection. He said, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord and I have nothing good besides you. Now here's David, probably was king at this time. And we think of kings as having it all. You know, wealth, power, influence, uh, anything they wanted, they had, you know, in, that, in the kingdom. David, David could uh, have it. Uh, Solomon had it. Uh, the kings of the day, you know, or, or have wealth in their in their kingdom. Uh, and that's the way uh, David felt here. With all the wealth that he had, he counted it as trash. He counted it as nothing compared to God. He said, I have nothing good besides you, Lord. Uh, David was saying, you are the only one thing that really counts in my life. All these other things are will go to waste. All these other things will rust. All these other things will will fall apart. All these other things will, 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 will one day be gone. But all I have is you that is good in my life. And David recognized that, that God, without God, he was nothing. Without God, he had nothing good in his life. With God, all things can be good. As for the holy people of the land, they are the noble ones. I think uh, David was saying here, he took refuge and he took comfort knowing that there was others in his kingdom that loved God too that were holy people seeking God he considered them noble ones he considered them equal to him you know he was king but he looked at them as hey they're brothers and sisters they're noble ones also because they love you Lord and and he took comfort in knowing that there was other people out there that loved God. And I take comfort in that. I hope you take comfort in that. Knowing that we have brothers and sisters uh, at Mount Zion and whatever church we go to that love God and are seeking God like you seek God. And that's comfort knowing that we can go to them uh, in, at any time, happy, in times of happiness, times of stress, times of loss. And we know that they'll be there for us. And we know they understand uh, how we feel and we know that they'll comfort us and we'll comfort them and it's great we can delight in them we can enjoy their presence in our lives and sometimes you know it's not what we say it's just being there uh, when times are difficult just having someone else that you can put your arms around and hug and he knew that there was other believers in his kingdom and he took delight in them but he also went on to say the sorrows of those who take another god by themselves will multiply. In other words, when we refuse to accept God, when we refuse to go to God and 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 go to Him for our refuge and go after these other gods, we're going to multiply our sorrows. We're going to multiply our trials and our troubles. We're going to make things worse. And isn't that what usually what happens when people go after their gods and alcohol, drugs, power, money? They usually winds up destroying them, winds up destroying their families, winds up destroying uh, their bodies uh, and, and, and everything. So David knew where to search uh, to make his life better, to make him more uh, comfort, comforted when he had times of trouble. That's taking it to God. He knew that. He learned that lesson early, and it stuck with him throughout his whole life. We'll go on over in the Psalms night. Uh, 16 9 to 11 uh, we'll see here where uh, David was reflecting in, in those verses between 16 4 and 16 9 he was reflecting on how uh, God had how he had trusted God had God got him through it how God blessed him how God had been faithful to him and never failed him and so he says there in verse 9 therefore my God is glad my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My body also rests securely. For you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. So David saying, therefore, because God, you've always been there. You've never failed me. You've, uh, you've always blessed me. You've, I've trusted you and you've always been faithful. 
So therefore, my heart is just glad and I rejoice because I know you'll always be faithful. I know you'll always be there. I can rest securely knowing that even when trials come, even when troubles come, I can trust you. I may not see the answer. I may, you know, I may have to go through these trials and troubles, and we will. But God, I can trust you to get me through them. I can trust you to take me through them. And you know, there may be times when we're having a hard time dealing with it. I'm sure David had a hard time dealing with some situations in his life. And and we can get hurting inside, but we can know that God's going to get us through it. It's a path we've got to go through. But well, yeah, either I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's not fun walking through that valley, is it? But we know that God will get us through it. Even though it's tough going through it, God will see us through it. Uh, he goes on to say, For you will not abandon me to Sheol. You, won't, you will not uh, allow your faithful one to see decay. And that's about a prophecy about Jesus, about Jesus, you know, how he, he died, but he didn't, his body didn't see decay. In three days he rose again. And, uh, and God takes care of his faithful one, Jesus Christ. And David was referencing this. And David also knew that God wasn't going to abandon him. That David knew that there would be life after this death on earth. David held on to that hope. He, he recognized that God had greater plans than just life in this world for, for us, for his people. And when he redeemed his people through the blood of Jesus Christ, through, through uh, serving, uh, being uh, a follower of God, uh, in that day they were looking forward to the Messiah. In this day we're looking back at the Messiah. Uh, but David trusted that the Messiah, the faithful one, would not see decay and would be there for him. You reveal the path of life to me, and your presence is abundant joy at your right hand are eternal pleasures. Paul is saying, you lead me. You reveal your path to me. You lead me in my steps. In your presence, there's abundant joy. There's more joy. There's such abundant joy that I don't have to worry about it running out. I don't have to worry about it ending, uh, uh, not ever having joy again. God's going to give us that joy. Even in the storms of life, he can give us joy. We may not be happy, so to speak, about the situation, but we can rejoice knowing that God is seeing us through it. And at your right hand are eternal pleasures. God's going to bring us through this. He's going to bring us through the situation that we face in our daily lives. There's some of you out there who may be suffering right now, maybe hurting uh, because of a loss of a loved one. Some of you may be hurting because you're not, you don't know where uh, your next paycheck's coming from. Some of you may be worried because you're having marital troubles. You're having children troubles. Your children are hurting. Your children are going off in a direction that you really wish they wouldn't go, that you know it's going to harm them. And that hurts. But God, take it to God, and he'll get us through that. Put God first. Don't put those children first. Don't put that uh, spouse first. As much as we love them, we're to put God first. And then God will bless us and help us to get through these other situations and as we pray about that and, and take them to God in our prayers. You know, God loves us. Sometimes we do get sad. We do get hurting. But God loves us, and he's going to see us through it. And that's why we to put God first, and, and, and that's the first commandment. You know, and the other one is, is love our neighbors. And that's what we need to work on, too, is loving our neighbors. Uh, and then we'll look at that in honoring relationships uh, later on in our studies. But, but we really need to make sure that we put God first and then put others. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we do thank you for your blessings. I pray that you will help me. And help the others out there, Lord, to place you first. Uh, help, help us to focus upon you and not let the distractions of this world and the trials and troubles of this world distract us from following you, Lord. Help us to be faithful to you in, in our walk, in our lives, uh, trusting that you will take care of our needs and uh, guide us as we seek which way to go in the direction of our lives and, and how to treat others and, and give others respect, Lord. Just, just help us to trust you in that, Lord. Lord, we praise you and thank you for this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Goodbye. See y'all at church.
Love y'all. Bye.